So I can see you in between the buttons. That may be a good thing, Doctor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I, was I was telling the students, uh, we put up the bio last week, and I, I reminded them um, to, to read your bio before the class tonight. Um, and I said if they took my advice, they probably just finished reading it. Um, because uh, so this magnanimous amount of experience that you have, uh, you. not only in sports, a lot in sports, but in engineering as well and being a chief executive and a, the president of your own and CEO of your own company and the NFL PA, the Players Association and international global soccer around the world. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to put myself on mute. Um, I'm not going to say a word. It's all, it's all yours. I'm going to try and get it where you're, um, you're, you're front and center. Um, and you, you have the stage and you have it as long as you'd like. And tell us about yourself and go forward. So I'm going to set this up. I don't have my IT record with my daughter, so I'm going to try to set this up for a presentation. And uh, I think we've got it going. See the slide there on the screen? Perfect. Okay. So uh, thank you. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, and Dr. Reardon, thank you for inviting me. Uh, this is a true honor. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm actually very excited about being able to spend some time with the today. FAU has been a very important fixture in our lives, my family. Uh, we live nearby. My two daughters uh, spent countless hours playing soccer and practicing soccer uh, with Team Boca on the, on the campus fields. And actually, my, my youngest daughter, her graduation, she went to Oxbridge in Palm Beach, and her graduation was on campus uh, uh, two years ago, so um, it's 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 today being able to share with you guys and speak with you guys is a small and humble way uh, that I get the opportunity to finally give back to a great great institution. So it's very important to me. Um, so my name is Anthony Hilliard. Uh, I'm the CEO of the Sterling Group. Uh, I've been uh, involved in the sports industry for over 25 years. Uh, longer than some of you probably have been alive. Um, as a sports lawyer, I've guided the careers and negotiated endorsement and employment contracts on behalf of an exclusive group of world-class athletes who have participated in leagues on five different continents worldwide. And I've represented and advised athletes in all major sports, football, basketball, baseball, soccer, golf, and tennis. But the focus of my practice, uh, the, the area that I spent the most time with, uh, has been in international basketball and international soccer. Um, I have had the great opportunity to work with, and I've earned the respect and trust of some of the greatest coaches in professional sports, as well as college sports. Smith, Roy Williams, uh, David Blatt, Nick Nurse, who was a friend of mine we used to go to tournaments together over in Europe. I can't believe that he's in the NBA. Uh, Bill Guthridge, Jimmy Johnson. But the reason why I have these relationships with these individuals is because I earn their trust by doing the right thing in business with them, as well as doing the right thing in business for their players. Um, I'm here to tell you, and I want to remind you, a lot of things that go on today I want one thing to stay with you guys, and that is your integrity and your honor in this business is a precious commodity and it's the most important thing. People remember you if you keep your word and you do what you say. And this is, this is a, a competitive sports-based business, so when you say something, people intend for you to do it. And if you can keep that in mind, you can go very far in the business. Um, I've been invited to talk a little bit about the global business of sports. This is a topic that I could spend two, three semesters talking about. Uh, but what I'd like to do is do a flyover maybe at 50,000 feet and uh, talk about some important aspects that you'll be able to take with you uh, when we, we finish today. Um, so in the first section, I'd like to talk a little bit about my background and experience because I think it's important to know uh, what I do and why I do it, um, then 
get into the whole discussion of the global business of sports and just what it is, talk a little bit about the revenue, its size. Um, and then in section two, um, I'd like to talk about the impact of COVID-19 because this has been a major speed bump in our business recently. And then uh, speak about the rapid rise of global professional basketball. And Dr. Reardon, please uh, let me know. I've got a lot of material to go through. I'm going to do my best to go as quickly as I can, uh, but there's a lot of material that's here. We're all set. They they need a lot of material for their final project anyway, uh, Anthony. So, uh, yeah, uh, as much as you can give them, that, that that's awesome. I've been, I've been worried about uh, trying to go as fast as I can so I can fit into an hour. So great that I won't rush and I'll go through as much information as I can just to give them as much as I so um, I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, and I enjoyed a phenomenal school and academic career. Uh, I was a national merit semifinalist. Uh, I was all state in soccer, football, and track. Uh, I won seven state track championships, uh, the 200 as a sophomore, the 100, 200, and 400 as a junior and senior. Um, I've been told that I still have a couple of records that are standing there, and it's kind of strange to me that since I'm 102, uh, <laughs> that I still have some records. Um, in 1980, I was actually selected as the Missouri Athlete of the Year, which is very important to me because now around states, they have Mr. Football and Mr. Basketball. Look, in the old days, it was everybody thrown into one pot, and my real sport was track and field. So to be able to win that against some Basketball players and football players meant a lot to me. I was recruited by schools all over the country, being a Midwesterner, uh, Notre Dame, and a Catholic kid too. Uh, Notre Dame always stood out in my mind. Um, but I applied to a wide range of schools at my father's recommendation, and I was lucky enough to get into two Ivy League schools. And uh, he really wanted me to be the first one in my family to be able to go to an Ivy League institution. So I went to Dartmouth, and uh, this was a huge leap for a Midwestern kid, you know, from the plains and the flatlands of the central part of the country to go all the way up into the mountains and the cold and the snow of New Hampshire. Um, it was a big challenge for me in the classroom as well as on the track. Um, but I look back at this challenge as a student athlete many, many miles away from home. And I realize now that it actually taught me the benefits of discipline, hard work, organization, and perseverance. So I'm very indebted to that process. Uh, and that experience made me uh, the man that I am today. And since I mentioned uh, student athlete, here's photographic evidence of me as an athlete uh, some 200 years ago. Uh, this is actually highly classified information, so I'm going to ask all of you to sign in. NDA before we leave today, but this is actually um, the 4x4 four four, uh, relay at the end of the meet. Um, as a freshman, I was able to anchor that leg, and this is important to me also because of the fact that it was the first time that Dartmouth ever beat Harvard. Uh, we're all concerned about Harvard, and we, we don't like them. I don't even think they know we're on the same planet with them, but for me, that was um, a huge, huge opportunity. And so obviously, I, I, I still talk about it today. I bring this up, uh, my athletic history, not to brag about it, but more so to let you know that I am an athlete. And sports is intertwined in my life. Some of my earliest thoughts, memories deal with sports. And in my family, I have Olympians, uh, national team coaches, and professional athletes that I grew up with and helped me grow as a man. So I mention this because of the fact that I want you to know that I'm not just some guy who's in the business, but I'm an athlete who had the great opportunity to work with other athletes, and I understand athletes. Um, this was really a calling for me and not just a job. It's in my very soul. And I really mean it when I tell you some of my first memories are, are sports. So. Um, Anyway, my father was a physician. He wanted me to come back to St. Louis and work with him and, and continue his practice. I was a government major, uh, but I was taking my pre-med recs, and the sciences were just killing me. 
Um, I just did not have the aptitude for that. Um, I told him that I thought that I wanted to become a lawyer, and he laughed. And Actually, he didn't speak to me for two or three weeks. Uh, then after that, he laughed, and he said, okay, how are you going to do that? I told him that I was going to go through corporate recruiting and get a job as a legal assistant and work in a law firm to see if I really wanted to do that. Uh, I had a great opportunity to go to New York uh, right after graduation and work for Skadden Arp, Slate, Marr, and Flom. At that time, they were the largest law firm in the world, and I think now they're probably still up in that group. Um, this was an amazing time to be in New York. It was an amazing time to work on Wall Street. We had a, a crash of the stock market, um, and it was a great opportunity for me to see the legal industry from the inside. Um, what's kind of funny, too, is that uh, um, I shared a closet office, a little small office, slept under tables, worked 30 hours a day with Bill Daly. He was my office mate there. Bill is now the uh, deputy commissioner of the NHL. And I think it's, it's really funny that we were together and we worked hard and ran around that office uh, like we didn't know what to do next. Uh, and we both followed our dreams and were able to work in the sports industry. Uh, at Gadden, uh, there was a pivotal moment in my life where there was a young associate who gave me a little more leeway and work to do, which allowed me to learn more about the law. I actually participated in writing a brief that was filed with the Supreme Court, and I was the guy that took, took it down to file it. His name was Erwin Schwartz, and um, he was a wonderful man, and he just opened doors for me. Uh, he went to BC Law, and he thought that Boston College Law School would be a great place for me because I was familiar with Boston. Uh, Boston was the uh, outpost of civilization living up in New Hampshire. Dartmouth is about two hours north. I spent a lot of time there. He also thought that the environment there would be very, very close to what I experienced at Dartmouth. I was like, great, sounds good to me. I applied, I got in. Um, and uh, what I did know is that Robert C. Berry was there. I went to BC thinking that I'd be a corporate lawyer. Uh, but I, uh, Robert C. Berry, when I found out he was there, I fell out. For those of you who don't know, Professor Barry is considered the grandfather of sports law. He was the very first one to teach it as a discipline. And this is back in the time when we had no sports management, no sports business programs, there was zero. And while I'm just, I'd like to say to you that the reason why I'm here today is because I didn't have the resources that you guys have. And uh, it's really important to me to help you and it's really important for me to mentor you guys. And uh, I'm here with Dr. Reardon's uh, permission after this class, this session today, to help you guys in any way that I can, okay? Um, but Professor Berry was the very first one to distill this down into a discipline and teach it. When I met Professor Berry and we talked about this and I found out that I could co combine my love of law, sports, and business, the heavens opened, the angels were singing. There was nothing else that I wanted to do but work in this industry. Uh, Professor Berry was writing books. He was going to conferences. He, I was doing research for him. I was organizing a lot of things. So I fell into the business through Professor Berry. Um, my first two clients, uh, my second year of law school were Rick Fox and Eddie Pickney of the Boston Celtics. Uh, I was setting up autograph sessions for them in malls around Boston. Um, but Professor Berry opened these doors for me, and he was a father to me, a father figure. Uh, it's kind of odd, too, that I lost my dad and Professor Berry the same year, 2011. But uh, just like Erwin Schwartz changing my life, Professor Berry changed my life also. Um, Professor Berry was a little different from everyone else. Um, he actually worked with Bob Wolf. He was the stunt partner with Bob Wolf. Bob Wolf was the first mega agent in the business in Boston, representing Larry Bird, Clemens, and all those guys. You guys probably don't know about him, but he was the very first one, uh, a super agent, so to speak. Um, Bob consulted with him and stayed behind the scenes, but he did not like the business at all. And one of the things that he instilled in me 
is that, well, especially when he found out that my first job was going to be representing athletes, he sat me down and he told me that I had a responsibility to serve and empower athletes. He wanted me to make sure that their lives after their competitive uh, years were over were just as productive and fruitful and comfortable as the time when they were competing. I've never forgotten this advice, and I can confirm to you that in my entire professional life, I've been a servant leader, putting athletes first. And this goes back to me talking to you about being an athlete, because they, uh, I am one, and, and I grew up around athletes. Uh, this was a calling, and the opportunity to be able to uplift athletes, young athletes, older athletes, and, and, and be a servant leader was easy for me. Um, I helped men, young men and women maximize their competitive ability while they played, but I also made sure that while they were playing, uh, that they started to plan for the future and have a smooth transition into the second chapter of their life. Um, it's funny, a couple of years ago, uh, I woke up and I realized that I've always been a mentor disguised as a sports lawyer, disguised as an agent. <laughs> um, I owe all of this to Professor Barry, and his influence resonates through me and my work to this very day. On the topic of being a servant leader and a mentor to the people that you work with, uh, I want to clear up a major misconception about the business that I've been involved in for many, many years. It's portrayed in the movies and television as being very glamorous. Uh, what's the movie, Jerry Maguire? I've never seen it. I've seen maybe five minutes of it. Um, should be banned. I'm sorry? It should be banned. Yeah. The worst movie ever made. Sorry. Okay, well, there you go. But I, I'm saying that on the five minutes that I saw uh, of it, though. But um, the bottom line is, is that the way the business is portrayed in the media television is that it's glamorous and all you do is hang out with famous people. That's about one and a half or maybe 2% of it. The other 98% of it is a highly competitive wild, wild west, anything goes type of business. That's why I speak about being a life manager. I speak about being a servant leader and taking care of athletes because you can get really caught up in a game that doesn't exist and there's no finish line. Um, majority of agents are not that good. Most of them have not learned their craft uh, they're more committed to building their bank accounts and building fame, and they're motivated by money and power. Um, and I can tell you that anyone in the business, uh, for those two reasons, will not last long. I have seen them come and go. Come and go. Even, even many other industries who thought that they were, well, they were very successful in their other industries, but thought they could just walk into this one and do well. Uh, there have been many times that I wanted to leave the business because it just wasn't right for me spiritually. Um, but I always stayed in because the Vesuvera would always say to me, be a point of light in a very dark business. Um, so, you know, for me, instead of chasing the money and the power, uh, I was in to the business of building careers and enhancing lives and hopefully helping athletes so that they could help generations in the future, their families. Um, I wasn't just a sports lawyer. I'm not just an agent. Uh, I've been a trusted confidant, consultant, advisor, and friend to many families and players, or to many players and their families. Um, and I have chosen this path and I've extracted a lot of great joy and a two, true sense of purpose from leading and supporting these people. Um, so I could talk about this for hours also, but you've got to understand, as I said earlier, your integrity and how you do business stays 
with you. And um, it's important to remember that we're here in whatever capacity in the sports industry to support athletes in every way that we can. One of the most important and I guess highlights of my career is the work that I uh, did with one of my good friends uh, and one of my oldest clients, Robert Pack. Um, this is actually a picture from Robert from the 1994 dunk contest at the All-Star Game. Uh, this guy is 6'2 and uh, could fly through the air. Actually, he looks like Jordan in that picture. Um, the bottom line is, is that uh, because it was in Minneapolis, uh, he was robbed and they gave it to J.R. Ryder. Um, but the bottom line is, is that Robert Pack, uh, I helped him put together a 14-year NBA EuroLeague career. He's now an assistant coach for the Washington Wizards. I'm sorry. Uh, um, he started off with the Bullets. Um, Robert was a diamond in the rough. He wasn't on everybody's radar. And as a matter of fact, on draft day, he was in the gym. I knew that he wasn't going to get drafted. And we were okay with that because we were committed to each other and we were committed to, to doing all that we could to realize his dream. Um, as I said, he was in the gym on draft day, we worked really hard. We got him an invitation to the summer league. He played so well in the summer league, he got an invitation to vet camp. He played so well in vet camp, he got a one-year deal to play with the Portland Trailblazers. And that year, he went on to make the NBA Finals the 91-92 season with the Chicago Bulls. They lost, uh, but he played so well that after that he was able to parlay that into a multi-year deal, which then led to a 14-year career. Um, this is building a career. It's easy representing a lottery pick. Your phone rings. It's a totally different game when you are trying to bring someone up. We had diamond in the rough and trying to get someone the exposure, someone the contract, someone the endorsements, who wasn't one of the chosen people before the draft started. Um, what's more important, and not just that story about the career, is that Robert's from the Ninth Ward of New Orleans, one of the poorest areas in the country. Uh, he took me back there to, and showed me the house where his family, he and his sisters grew up, and I, I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. He also took me to an alley where he got into some argument with some guy and a gun was placed to his head. The only thing to save is an old man on a, a, a porch, like a yard or two over who saw all of this and yelled and stopped it. That was an important moment for him because he made a conscious decision at that point to have a straight life and to do the right thing to go to school and, and do everything the right way. Um, Robert was easy to work with because he was humble. Um, he listened, he did not spend a ton of money. He did not buy jewelry and cars. He saved, he prepared. We talked about what he wanted to do. He talked about coaching. He talked about coaching on a high school level or a co college level, but the fact that he's coached in the D League and the NBA went beyond his wildest dreams. Um, he gave me the name Pitbull, <laughs> which I appreciated. Uh, it told me that he trusted me and that he knew I'd do the right thing for him. It was my job to say no, and I had no problem saying no often. Um, he came up with nothing, I mean, dirt poor, but through his, his uh, career and the money that he made, and he saved it, he built a huge home for his mother in Houston. He built a huge home for himself. He also seeded uh, several businesses for all types of family members with capital to raise them up also. And this is what I was talking about earlier, about being a servant leader and a life manager and helping athletes grow and transition uh, in their life after sports. Um, I used to talk to his mother more than I spoke to him. But that was also a sign to me that he trusted me and he knew I would do the right thing with the most important person in his life. 
Um, so uh, we used to have a we used to have a saying, and he lived by it, is that you can live like a prince, you don't have to live like a king, right? And because he adopted that attitude and internalized it, he was able to save a lot of money. He's very, he does not have to coach right now. He does it because of the love of the game. Um, so also, I talked about that 2% of the glamour stuff and the 98% of the hard work. Um, this was in Minneapolis, so my 2% of the glamour stuff uh, was actually satisfied because we went to several parties after this dunk contest because he was very upset. He should have won. You guys can go back and take a look at it on YouTube. Uh, they gave it to J.R. Ryder. But we wound up at a uh, an after party at Prince's house. And I actually got to meet Prince and his wife, uh, Maite, I think her name was. So uh, even though I was saying the 2%, there are certain things. Prince is my favorite of all time. He's the goat in my book. Um, but the small perks do help. Uh, with all the heavy lifting and things that you do uh, for for others. Um, another guy who I'm very proud of, you probably know this face, you've seen it, or you probably heard his voice because he doesn't, uh, he talks all the time, is John Sallet. Um, I was a very, very trusted advisor to John Sally on everything from business, basketball, family. Um, John and I started working together after he had been in the league for quite some time and won two championships with the Pistons. Um, frankly, and he doesn't mind me talking about it, when I started working with him, he was in dire straits. And he worked for the big agency before we met, but because he got a big contract uh, coming into the league and he spent big, and there was no one there to do the right thing and to help him out, um, he got into some trouble. Um, when I talked about integrity and doing the right thing all the time and how your reputa reputation precedes you, uh, early in my career, I had developed um, a reputation as a fixer with veteran athletes, a guy that could extract them from problems. And John was one of these guys that heard about me and we started working together. Um, I am so thankful and proud to be a part of the second chapter to his life. Um, I am the guy that consoled John Sally in 95 when he was left unprotected by the Miami Heat in the expansion draft. He couldn't believe it. He said, I have two rings. What? They don't want me. The truth was John was getting a little older and was transitioning from a starter to a role player. Um, but I'm the guy that sat him down and told him, hey, look, this might be an opportunity. And if we manage it the right way, who knows what can happen? Well, what that led to was him being drafted by the Toronto Raptors in their inaugural year. Uh, Isaiah Thomas was the general manager, is why I brought him in. But I'm the guy that negotiated him out of that contract with the Raptors and into a contract with the Chicago Bulls. And that was the season um, that they went on to have the record-breaking 72-win season that was just broken by the, the Warriors, I think, a year or two ago. Um, and it was also uh, the year that he won his third championship with the Bulls when they beat the Supersonics. Um, I'm also the guy that helped him start his entertainment career which took off. He had actually a talk show that was kind of like uh, a late night talk show that a lot of people don't know about. You've probably seen him in Bad Boys, the original Bad Boys. I'm the guy that kind of helped him because that's what he wanted to do. Um, he had the gift of being able to go into entertainment or into television. Um, so we worked on that uh, toward the end of his playing days. And I'm also the guy that brought him back to Los Angeles Lakers in 1999 to get his fourth championship ring. Um, and John is very unique because he is the first player or was the first player to win four championships, three different teams, three different in three different decades and in two different millenniums. Uh, I am really proud of the fact that when we met, John was not in the best of conditions, but when he went off and 
uh, we're still friends today, but I don't represent him anymore. But when he made that transition into the next chapter, the third chapter of his life, which is entertainment, I actually helped him build that important second part. So, um, so that's a little bit about me. Um, I, I, it's important for you to know who I am and what I've done. Also to let you know a little bit about the inside of the business. And I hope it's helpful. Um, so I, 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 I want to get to the global sports business, but before we get there, I think it's important to really look at the power of sports um, because it has an odd hold on our minds and our hearts, and we've really figured that out lately when we don't have it, just how important it is. But also because of the fact that it's this very strong emotion uh, that you can feel coursing through your veins that sports creates that is the real driving force behind the rise of importance and acceptance of the sports business in society. Um, I actually taught a class recently about the turn of the century, uh, early 20th century, and how this all started. And it all started with the passion for sports. Uh, statement here by Nelson Mandela, which is very important to me. Sport has the power to change the world. It has the power to inspire. It has the power to unite people in a way that little else can. Sport can awaken hope where there was previously only despair. And whenever I see that, I think about Jesse Owens in the Berlin Olympics and how his performance changed history. Um, especially with Adolf Hitler looking down at him at the time. Uh, sports is a very, very powerful phenomenon. Ashton Coe, who was a tremendous Olympian and is now the president of the IAAF, he states that sport is a universal language, building more bridges between people than anything else I can think of. And I couldn't agree with him more. Sport is that one factor that unifies everybody. It doesn't matter how tall you are, how short you are, what your religion is. It's a way that we all can bond and enjoy a special moment or some aspect of the game. It is an incredible unifier. And that's where we're talking about the power of sports. The experts have found that sports is a sociocultural phenomenon. It intertwined with and history of families, towns, regions, and countries. We can all remember where we were when certain events happened. We've all sat around a table and discussed a certain sports event. And there are actual cities that are intertwined with particular games or athletes, like Chicago is with Michael Jordan especially during that amazing time uh, that he showed up that there was another level to the athlete and another level to the way teams could play. I, we also witnessed that in soccer with Brazil. The Brazilians love their national team. Wars have stopped, conflicts have stopped. It doesn't matter if you are poor and live in the favelas or you are wealthy living in some mansion. All the Brazilians get together and they love their national team, which is one of the greatest soccer teams, national soccer teams ever in the history of the game. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the power because when you understand the power, you understand influence. When you understand influence, that opens the door to other things. Um, so the global of business of sports what is the global business of sport? Uh, a very long definition here, but I think it's important to go over for several reasons. The, the global business of sports is a highly specialized market. And people, activities, businesses, organizations are involved in the production, facilitation, promotion, or the organization of activities and experiences whose core focus is on sports. It is a market of varying economic dimension within which the products offered to its buyers are sports related and may be goods, services, people, places, or ideas. 
definition, it mentioned market a couple of times. I'm here to submit to you that it's not the traditional competitive market that we're also aware of. Um, I would argue that it's more of an ecosystem instead of a competitive market. And when we talk about a competitive market, another long definition here, a competitive market is one where there are numerous producers that compete with one another to provide goods and services that we as consumers want and need. And this one's an easy one to understand, the fast food market, McDonald's, Burger King, whatever. Um, this market is one where the competitors, either one would prefer that their, the other one would be decimated, just completely wiped off the face of the earth so that they could get all of the market share in that particular business. That is what most competitive markets are. The business ecosystem is a dynamic network of entities and organizations, including suppliers, distributors, customers, and producers involved in the delivery of a specific product or service through both competition and cooperation. That is the most important one, competition and cooperation. I submit to you that the sports industry is an ecosystem made up of separate, independent, but interdependent entities whose coexistence is vital to the sustainability, growth, and profit of the overall system. And to give you uh, an idea of what that looks like, it's a simple graphic. In the upper right-hand cor uh, corner, we've got the blue circle there. Uh, which are content providers, it's easy to understand, leagues, teams, associations. In the bottom, we've got goods and service providers. That's also, we can understand that one, sports agencies, sporting goods manufacturers, food and beverage. In the upper left hand, we've got distribution channels, television, satellite, cable, radio, internet, that's easy. In the center, the diversified sport and entertainment, private equity-backed companies. I wanted to spend just a little bit of time on that one. You guys may know about it, but if you don't, I wanted to make sure that you were aware of it because if we have disruption in this ecosystem, it will come from that point. But as I was saying, distribution channels, this is easy to understand. ESPN, Sky Sports, Fox NFL, goods and service providers, also Budweiser, we see that everywhere, Adidas, Nike, Reebok, McDonald's. And then content providers, Basketball Australia, NCAA, Arsenal, National Hockey League, Bill Day. Um, these are the organizations that create, play the sports and create the content. Diversified sport, entertainment, private equity based companies can be the best way to give you guys a glimpse of what that is, is the annual entertainment group, AEG. And I don't know if you guys are aware these or not, but they're an American global sports entertainment company. It was the world's largest owner of venues, sports franchises, music brands, ticketing platforms, and sports events. And they were actually the second largest promoter of live music and entertainment events. Uh, just a juggernaut here. You can take a look. Yeah. I mean, yes, sir. Yeah, they just merged with the SMG, the other big uh, uh, time uh, arena stadium operator. And can, yeah, so they're, so they're definitely the largest. It's now called ASM Global. Yes, right, right. But the, the, the big deal is that they own a little bit of everything. <laughs> and, and they're in all of those circles that we, we showed there. And that's why I just wanted uh, your class to understand that if we have a disruption, it will be from here. Um, Coachella, uh, the tour of California, as well as the Galaxy and the Lakers and Staples Center and the O2 Dome in London. It's important to understand these, this type of entity because we're going to see, we will see a disruption coming in the future because of the way they are organized and what their business model was. And I just wanted to bring it up. And Doctor, thank you for. Uh, for uh, bringing that up, up to me here. So the ecosystem here is, we, we saw the circles put together and now it's filled out with the consumers um, surrounding the whole 
uh, ecosystem. And the consumers come from different areas, participants, male, female, youth. These are athletes, spectators, people that go to watch events, um, uh, viewers who watch and read and listen to devices. And then we have the leagues and teams and coaches and corporations, governments in uh, the rest of the world outside of the United States, governments play a larger role in sports across the board than uh, it does here. But I think this is a great way of looking at um, the global business of sport. And uh, it is a group of independent but interdependent entities that all do well if others do well. There is no, there, there is healthy competition, but there is no desire to just annihilate people from the marketplace. And that's something we all need to keep in mind um, when we're having this discussion. So the next question is, what, what is the size and scope of the global sports industry? Uh, the global sports market reached a value of nearly 489 billion in 2018 having grown at an annual growth rate of more than 4% since 2014, and it is expected to grow at an annual growth rate of about 6% to almost 614 billion by 2022. Uh, we're throwing around numbers here in the billions of dollars. It doesn't seem much on paper, but this is significant. Uh, the sports industry is the second fastest growing sector for brands outpacing the GDP growth of most countries. That is unbelievable, and it's a little difficult to wrap your mind around that, but always remember that revenue is power, and with power, you have influence, and everyone wants revenue so that they can influence others to do what they want or purchase what they're selling. And that's why it's important to understand the revenue aspect of the sports industry, because it does give it a certain perch or a certain position of importance in the global economy. A snapshot of the North American market, sports market size, stretching from 2009 to 2023, this is in billions of dollars. You can see in 2009, it's just under 50 billion. And in 2023, it's projected to be at 83 billion just in North America alone. Top revenue producing sports leagues worldwide, the National Football League at 16 billion, uh, the National Basketball Association at 8 billion, uh, Indian Premier League Cricket, 6.3 billion. Australian rules, rules football, one of my favorites, uh, 2.5 billion, and little old league on uh, the French league uh, at only 1.5 billion. Um, these are some just mind-boggling numbers, but again, revenue is power. Look at some of the most valuable sports franchises worldwide. These numbers fluctuate. But these are relatively on point. Dallas Cowboys at $5 billion. That's mainly because of the Star Complex, which is a tremendous place. I actually toured that complex when it was being built. $4.24 billion. Uh, any Nick fans in the house <laughs> uh, at $4 billion. Um, that's really because of the real estate also. Um, the garden sitting over Penn Station in New York City, and then moving through the Lakers at 3.7, and then the Giants, New York Giants, and the Los Angeles Dodgers at 3.3 billion. And all of these numbers are staggering, but they do indicate the influence that these these franchises wield, and the influence that the leagues and the sports that they play in. Uh, the power that they wield and influence, they wield also. But before before I continue down the path of talking about uh, money, and we'll continue, um, I need to talk to you about COVID-19 and the effects that this pandemic has had on the industry. 
touching every aspect of it, from professional leagues, international associations, and even going down to college, high school, and youth sports. Uh, financial impact of COVID-19. Um, according to the analysis conducted by Washington University in St. Louis, professional sports could lose $5.5 billion due to the pandemic. The same study estimates that the 65 Kappa uh, Hour 5 conference colleges could collectively lose more than $4 billion in college football revenue, with, with at least $1.2 billion of that due to lost ticket revenue. Um, Major League Baseball could lose upwards of $2.5 billion if the season is suspended until July, and it's estimated that the NBA could lose more than $1 billion if it is unable to resume the 2019 and 20 season at any point. I want to talk about that a little later too. Uh, this is all horrible news for anyone who's a sports fan around the world, but I'm here to tell you that this isn't the first time that we've had to encounter a similar silent, deadly uh, enemy. Uh, the impact of the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic is eerily similar to what we're going on uh, through right now. Uh, with COVID-19, what's going on socially, politically, and also in the business of sports. Um, the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic lasted 15 months and killed an estimated 50 to 100 million people worldwide, including 675,000 Americans. Uh, more than 500 million people, about one third of the population, were infected around the world. Uh, the college football season in 1918 was one of the strangest moments in the history of the sport. And this picture is actually from a Georgia Tech football game. You can see them wearing uh, masks like we, we do now. Um, the college football games didn't start until October, November of that year, and the teams played a condensed season. And at least 18 teams didn't play that college football season, which people have told me is uh, almost near like what three quarters of the team's not playing now. Uh, masks were common uh, in 1918 and 1919 during this pandemic. As you can see, uh, players, umpires, managers wore them during games. And although the first case of Spanish flu appeared in the United States in March of 1918, <laughs> Major League barreled straight ahead and began their season as scheduled on April 16th. Uh, the pandemic wound up canceling the last month at the end of the regular season, and the entire season ended with game six of the World Series on September 11th, which uh, the Boston Red Sox uh, won against the Chicago Cubs. And as a St. Louis Cardinals fan, I'm very happy about that. Historians have determined that this World Series uh, actually helped spread and caused a second wave throughout the country of the United States, which is a big fear of sports restarting now. And actually, I heard you guys speaking a little bit about the discussion you were having earlier. Uh, with all of the social unrest and protests going on around the country right now, that is one big concern of mine of what the after effect will be uh, with the virus that we're dealing with today. And I'm glad you guys had that conversation too. Every major world sport and every major world sporting event has experienced some type of disruption during this pandemic. The loss of revenue from these disruptions could have devastating long-term effects uh, throughout the industry. Since the opening of the first modern Olympic Games in 1896, the international sports competition has only been canceled three times, once during World War I in 1960 and twice during World War II in 1940 and 1944. And so Outbreak, which postponed these games until 2021, which was a great decision, mainly for the athletes who needed 
a schedule, a certain training schedule, because the not knowing or what was going to happen was just destroying that opportunity. The Olympics weathered political charge boycotts and two separate terrorist attacks without being canceled or postponed during peacetime. So we've witnessed something quite amazing. The store Wimbledon Lawn Tennis Club was forced to cancel Wimbledon for the first time since World War II, which is another amazing point uh, in the world of sports. Since the early 1980s, the NBA has served as the vanguard in all the sports business. They have always been at the tip of the spear for change. They've always been ahead of the curve and at the forefront of change in relation to labor issues, legal issues, as well as social inclusion and diversity matters. The NBA made a bold, monumental decision to suspend play on March 11, 2020, at a time when most sports leagues, businesses, and even governments were dithering about what to do next. His decision set off a chain of events that led to the postponement of several high-profile sporting events, including March Madness, the NHL season, spring training for baseball, and the Masters. The NBA's groundbreaking move on that day may be considered as a major pivotal moment in the early stages of the COVID-19 pandemic here in the United States. One of the most well-respected medical experts in the country made a statement to USA Today, which really characterized uh, the brave decision uh, that Silver and the NBA made. Uh, speaking about, um, he said, his action was instrumental at getting the political will and the economic will across the, uh, across the country over the hump to switch us from one mode of thinking to another and get us to realize this is no longer an inconvenience and it is a national emergency. point you how important that decision was and later history will show just how amazing and impactful it was, especially here in the United States but around the world, because everyone there were dominoes that fell right after that. Um, it's very clear that Silver and the NBA were very prepared and they were much further ahead on the than most governments in the Western Hemisphere. Um, I'm confident that Silver arrived at his decision because of his global mindset, experience managing international business. For me personally, on the international scale, I saw this coming. Those of us who worked internationally saw this coming because on a daily basis, speaking to people in different time zones, speaking to partners in Asia, and Europe, we got a different picture of how this was unfolding. We got a different picture of how this wave was coming. coming. While the media here and news outlets, North and South America, um, really weren't as urgent about it. Uh, I mentioned the global mindset and in the context of business management, um, effective global leadership requires a local mindset, which is thinking globally and leading locally. It requires a keen understanding of the interconnection of global and local issues. It is the adaptation or synthesis of global and international events into local context. It requires leaders to be like explorers guiding their organizations through unfamiliar and turbulent environments. It is a choice to lead by making sound, informed decisions locally based on facts, data gathered from source points and professionals around the world. Um, I could expand on this uh, for hours, if not a semester, 
but managing an international enterprise, especially an international sports enterprise, you take in information from your staff, you take in information from competitors from all different parts of the world, and you have to be aware of different regulations, different currencies, different cultures, and you take all that information and then you apply it locally where you reside or where in other markets that you work in, and every market is different. Um, so it's just a different way of thinking, and, and uh, it's certainly different from a sports uh, enterprise that is focused on a domestic market. So again, I, I don't want to take too long on this, but it's very important, and to me, what Silver and the NBA did was just unbelievable. So what is the next step for the NBA? Um, there's a comment that Adam made on the 8th of May, which really I thought was great. Back then, now we know what happened today, but back then, the ultimate issue is how much risk we're all comfortable taking. And when I saw this, I, I just find, found it so interesting because to me, it indicates that Silver took the time to weigh the very future, the very existence of the NBA, and the well-being of his athletes. And that's one exercise that I didn't sleep over. But he has a responsibility to the commissioner, and he also has a, there's a, to the league, the well-being of the league, but he also has a responsibility to the well-being of, of the players uh, that are part of that. Uh, but this comment to me also indicated that he did his homework. Uh, he wasn't guessing. It wasn't a gut feeling to him. He gathered as much data as possible to make an informed decision. Uh, to navigate and lead his organization through a difficult time. Um, so I, I, I think that this told us something, uh, kind of gave, foreshadowed what was going to happen, but I can only imagine uh, the sleepless nights that he had and also the days of just soaking in and processing all that information from different points around the world. But again, he did that and he made an informed decision. As we all know, today the, the NBA plans to restart uh, the 2019-2020 season by bringing 22 teams to the Disney ESPN's Wide World of Sports Complex in Orlando. The games will begin on July 31st and conclude no later than October 12th. The league will create a secure NBA-only biosphere within the complex that will include strict health, safety, and coronavirus testing protocols for all of the participants, not just the players, but the limited uh, team of coaches and support staff. We've got 13 teams from the Western Conference, nine teams from the Eastern Conference, eight regular season games per team uh, to play in for the eighth seed. Um, basically, we're going to have basketball games on television, all day long, NBA basketball, all day long, format, which, if this is done correctly, is going to drive interest and viewership through the roof because there's such an appetite right now for sports. I've spent a lot of time over the past couple of months consulting with leagues and teams about what the other side looked like. And the, the time is now to plan and not to dither and wait so that we could actually hit the ground running, and we are at that point now. Uh, and as far as Adam is concerned, in the midst of a storm, using the global mindset, the NBA made rational, informed decisions based on a stream of empirical information from different global sources and moved quickly to save its future. You guys are aware of lost revenue but there are repercussions of lost revenue with the salary cap contract values that would go well into the future that would devastate the league and, and could have changed it from the way it looks right now. And this is what was hanging in the balance. I, I had to talk about COVID-19. I'd like to pick up where we left off. I think we're on this slide with the most valuable sports franchises in the world. 
We talked about the Cowboys and the Knicks. Um, I've highlighted here uh, Real Madrid, Barcelona, and Manchester United. Because I think it's interesting when we're talking about the global business sport and revenue and how revenue is power and power is influence. Three of the top six are actually football teams. They're soccer teams. It's called football around the world. Um, and these three in the top six here happen to be juggernaut brands globally, a following world of a worldwide nature, not a regional nature, but a worldwide nature. There's the question, what is the most popular sport worldwide? I think we've already answered that, that soccer or football is king worldwide. We've talked about the revenue, we need to talk about the viewership because in addition to the massive revenue uh, that it generates, the global viewership and spectator participation figures of world football is simply massive. Uh, 3.6 billion turn, tuned in to watch the 2018 World Cup in Russia, making it the biggest single sport competition ever viewed on television. The English Premier League, uh, the top division in England and the top in the world, is the most watched professional sports league in the world. It is broadcast in, to, in more than 213 territories to more than 650 million homes across the world. 650 million homes with over 5 billion viewers tuning in to live action at some point every season. For the 18-19 season, uh, the average Premier League match attendance was approximately 38,000, while the aggregated attendance figure across all matches was the highest of any league in the world at 14 and a half million. Uh, this is why football is the most popular sport and is key uh, in the world. Right. The union between the NBA and FIBA has created a very unique product, a phenomenon actually, that has allowed the sport of basketball to transform into the fastest growing major sport on the planet. Sample of, so we're talking about viewership, a sample of uh, basketball viewership. The NBA globally, it's programming, programming the 17, 18 season reached more than 1 billion unique viewers and more than 35% of the visitors to NBA.com came from fans outside of North America. Uh, the NBA in China, according to official figures, more than 600 million viewers in China watched NBA content in the 17th and 18th season. The World Cup, another big competition, it's not big here, but it's big everywhere else. Uh, China's broadcast, it was it took place in, in China, China's broadcast coverage of the 19 FIBA World Cup drew the tournament's TV, largest TV viewership with state-owned CCTV recording the two highest live ratings of the World Cup, including 68 million and 60 million for China's respective games versus Poland and Korea. And then the finals uh, of that World Cup competition where Spain beat Argentina, the event had a total global reach of an estimated 160 million viewers. Um, these numbers are amazing and show that basketball is rapidly uh, approaching uh, football uh, for the top position. So the question becomes, how did international basketball evolve and grow at such a rapid pace? Um, it's funny for me to see international basketball games now on television. My first time uh, seeing it, I was actually studying abroad and was leaving a soccer game and walking across the parking lot and seeing tons of people filing into an arena. And I said, what's going on over there? And they said, basketball. And I said, they have basketball here? <laughs> that was in France. Um, but international basketball recently has just found uh, unprecedented popularity. And the reason why it has risen to the point that it is at now is all to due to this man, 
David Stern. Uh, he was a colossus in the world of basketball. He was a power broker extraordinaire, uh, a visionary who had the strength and the confidence to take bold leaps of faith and make uh, just tremendous biz business decisions. And he saw things that other people just could not see. Uh, he understood to save the NBA, uh, which was really on life support when he took over. Uh, the entire business structure of the NBA had to be raised to the ground and rebuilt from the ground up. And he wasn't afraid to do it. Uh, Jerry Colangelo, uh, former owner of the Suns and USA basketball chairman, I, I love this comment of his. He reinvented himself in my mind. He was a young, very highly thought of lawyer when he came into basketball, and he made himself a marketing guy. He just put his mind to it, and he really got himself involved in a new technology like cable television, uh, which was kind of a new thing back then. So he was prepared to take the lead to an entire, another level. Uh, I love this quote, uh, and I think it's funny. Uh, new technology like cable television. Well, uh, I remember 1984 very well, and I'm here to tell you that cable television was really, really cool back then. Uh, the ability to watch MTV and videos, I was transfixed back then. The truth of the matter is, is that David Stern had a gift. Uh, he understood that some new, it wasn't going to be cable television, but some, some new aspect of cable television. Uh, at the time, some, some new powerful iteration of technology that he couldn't even really comprehend at the time. He knew that at some point it would be available to him in the future and it would be very crucial to his plans to project and amplify the NBA product to consumers beyond the borders of North America. Uh, David literally pulled the NBA out of the financial abyss an unimaginable era of prosperity. He served between February 84 and February 2014. He was the commissioner in the history of North American team sports and managed the NBA's growth from fears of extinction in the late 70s to a $5 billion enterprise in 14. NBA television revenue increased more than 40 fold in that span, crossing the 1 billion threshold. Uh, he had its new franchise going in Virginia, two in Canada, uh, the Raptors, and now the Memphis Grizzlies. Uh, in 2004, the league reached 30 teams with the Charlotte Bobcats, now the Hornets, the team that Michael Jordan owns. Uh, Stern created the women, women's NBA, the WNBA, which is tremendous. I love women's basketball. In 1997, and the uh, NBA's developmental league, which is now known as the G League, in 2001. Uh, the G League is very important because it is about to be a game changer. I actually had a client uh, in the developmental league the first year and used to argue time and time again with the NBA about the need to have a viable second division. They listened. They now have created a second division that's really built on the model of uh, the academy system in Europe. They're attracting a lot of new uh, young talent, and we're about to see a true game changer, uh, and we're about to see the NCAA uh, be put between a rock and a hard place. Uh, I can talk about that forever, uh, but we'll move forward here. Uh, in 1985, and this is pretty incredible, Jerry Reinsdorf brought the Chicago Bulls for $16 million. In 2014, shortly after David left the NBA, Steve Ballmer of Microsoft fame purchased the Clippers for $2 billion. That's quite an increase. And uh, on my side of the fence, uh, the fact that in 1984, the average salary was $250,000, it's now grown to approximately $9, billion, uh, 9 million, forgive me, uh, is an amazing thing, is an amazing thing. And it wasn't easy. Here's a quick snapshot of the National Basketball Association's total league revenue. 
uh, spanning from 2001, 2002 season to 17 and 18. And you can see where it started off just a little over two and a half billion dollars. And by 2018, um, it was eight billion. Um, this is all the work of David Stern, uh, who uh, understood what was necessary in order to make things happen. He understood that globalization and technology would allow him to effectuate a transformational change to the league and its business model. Globalization is the key to the league's survival. Um, he understood that in order to grow the league properly, uh, he would have to find consumers outside of the borders of North America. There was no way, like other sports, uh, I'm going to say the NFL, I'm going to say the league baseball, they do things internationally, but not in the way that the NBA has. Um, and David understood way back then that in order to grow it to the point that it is now, that he had to find consumers outside of the borders here. He also understood the technology would serve as a useful tool to allow him to amplify and project the NBA's voice and brand uh, to the eyes and ears of people all over the world. However, these two issues were clear. He also understood or realized that he needed a bridge or pathway to connect uh, with these people. So it's not you couldn't just show them things. You would have to really connect with them viscerally. And he needed a bridge in order to do that. And David figured out that that bridge that he needed was FIBA. Uh, FIBA is a highly efficient, massive global sports federation that runs with utmost of precision. Uh, it has served as a model for sports governing bodies for many, many years. The association was founded in Geneva on June 18, 1932, two years after the sport was officially recognized by the IOC. It takes care of everything basketball, the rules, the spec it specifies the equipment, facilities required, it organizes international competition, it even controls the appointment of international referees. Uh, it also has 213 uh, national member federations located in five zones. Africa, the Americas, Asia, Europe, and Oceania. Uh, FIBA's headquarters, the House of Basketball, is located in Switzerland on the shores of Lake Geneva. Uh, they have five offices uh, around the world. The one in Miami just opened uh, two months ago. Uh, that is the official office of the Americas, and then additional offices in uh, Beijing and Singapore. Uh, literally, literally, FIBA is located around the globe in all of these zones and all of these continents that we've talked about. Uh, but when we discuss these zones, Europe, Oceania, Africa, we know the major countries there, uh, but a lot of people don't understand that the smaller, lesser known nations uh, where basket basketball is very prominent and popular. Uh, how many people knew that there was basketball in the Cook Islands or Samoa or Antigua? Uh, or Kazakhstan, <laughs> but this tells you the reach that FIBA has, and David understood this, and in order to grow and to get more consumers and to have interest, he had to go to the four corners of the earth. Uh, we talked about earlier that FIBA manages uh, and operates some of the most popular and most watched elite competition in global sports, the EuroLeague for women, and the EuroLeague for men, actually the EuroLeague, or now called the Basketball Champions League, is the highest level of basketball outside of the NBA. You have a great mi mixture of European and world talent on top teams, as well as former NBA players and soon to be NBA players both of a foreign and American nature. The competition is amazing. And if you love basketball, you need to really check it out. Um, but all of these competitions are major, major uh, projects in each of their zones and countries. And the biggest one, of course, is the Olympics, uh, the FIBA oversees that. 
FIBA's Global Partnership, uh, Sponsorship Partners, is a collection of some of the uh, first class companies in the world. We see Nike there, Tencent, the huge uh, 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 television uh, company in China, Aeroflot from Russia. Uh, their list of global sponsorship partners is first class. Broadcast partners uh, that beam their product, Phoebus product, into the homes and citizens of countless countries around the globe is also massive. I'm sure you recognize some of these uh, that are here, but also Canal Plouve, which is in France. Uh, this is just a wonderful collection of broadcast partners. FIBA is a first-class organization uh, from top to bottom. So to recap a bit, Stern understood that technology would allow him to amplify the project, uh, amplify and project the brand and voice of the NBA. He understood that FIBA would serve as the bridge and allow the NBA to connect with consumers in far-flung places around the globe. But he also understood that there was one final item or one ingredient that was missing. There was one, one final ingredient that needed to ignite interest uh, about the NBA FIBA partnership worldwide. Uh, one that would generate excitement and enthusiasm about basketball on every inch of the globe. And, and that is, was the dream team. That was the missing ingredient. Um, the formation of this team was a side moment for all of professional sports and especially international basketball. Uh, the dream team created the perfect storm in the marketplace. It was something that we had never seen before. I know you guys know about it, but I'm here to tell you before that time, there was nothing like it at all. Uh, it actually merged the NBA star power uh, with the highly organized and vastly efficient infrastructure of FIBA. Uh, this was an amazing moment and all of us in sports were transfixed by it. Um, prior to this moment, superstar NBA players weren't allowed to participate in the, the Olympic Games. Stern established a productive relationship with FIBA that began just months after taking over the NBA's commissionership position. And when he started a friendship with then Secretary General uh, Borislav Stankovic, uh, that's on the right. Uh, the first huge step took place in 1989 when the FIBA Congress dropped the word amateur from its name and the Federation Internationale de Basketball Amateur, again, French. Uh, became the Federation Internationale de Basketball. That's huge. We removed that amateur label and inserted or, or taken it out and allowed the pros to come in, uh, which was a huge thing back then. Um, then on May 9th in 1990, Sankovic and Stern signed what might be the most important document in the history of basketball outside of the original rule written by Naismith, the creator of the game. Uh, this agreement and understanding between FIBA and the NBA gave all basketball players worldwide the right to play for their national teams. It also, this agreement, regulates all player transfers between both organizations and around the globe. This was the beginning of an extremely fruitful collaboration that launched international basketball literally into the stratosphere. Here's a wonderful quote by Michael Jordan, uh, who is the quote in my book. Uh, David grew the league into an international phenomenon, creating opportunities that few could have imagined before. His vision and leadership provided me with a global stage that allowed me to succeed. I wouldn't be where I am without him. That's a statement for Michael May, but it's not true. Oh, sorry. Uh, significant changes in the NBA post stream team. It, ins it literally inspired a generation of young international players who later made significant impacts in the NBA. Significant increase in the number of international players competing in the league and a significant rise 
in the number of international games and competitions around the globe. And most important, unparalleled interest in the game of basketball worldwide. The whole world was transfixed at seeing these stars play, and that's all they wanted after that point. Uh, many, many foreign players who were in the NBA admitted that when they were young and they saw the Dream Team, that motivated them to work and train to become the pros that they are today. Here's a list uh, for many players that just uh, did some amazing things. Uh, Manu Ginobili uh, used to be the managing director of North America for the largest international basketball company in the world into performances, and Manu Ginobili was one of our clients. A lot of people don't know that he's from Argentina and not from Italy, uh, but a wonderful man and had a great career. Dikembe Mutombo, Yao Ming, all of these guys changed everything for the NBA when they came in. Uh, rise of international players. Uh, there were 108 international players from 38 countries and territories on the opening night rosters for the 1920 season, marking the sixth consecutive season that opening night ros rosters featured at least 100 international players. And you've got to understand, we go back in the 70s, there were only a handful of that. Uh, so this is amazing, the transformation after 92 with the, the Dream Team. Uh, the record for international players in the league is 113, and that happened in the 16-17 season. And the record for countries and territories represented in the league is 42, and that was established in the 17-18 season. Of international games. There's a lot of information on this slide here. You can see it. But the bottom line is there were no international, virtually no international NBA games uh, back in the day. In the 70s, we had four, and they were more like a traveling exhibition. And it, the first one was in 78 with the Washington Bullets and Maccabi Tel Aviv, uh, but they were really exhibition matches. We moved from four to 27 in the 80s, which is tremendous. And in 87, the McDonald's Championship was introduced. And this was a hugely popular, popular world event uh, that started off in Milwaukee uh, and were held all throughout Europe. I mean, you, it was the cities where this, these events were held, it was in, the cities were just full of people that just wanted to come in and see the spectacle. But 27 in the 80s, 18 in the 90s, going up to 41 international games in the 2000s, and 85 in the 2010s. This is amazing. And you've got to understand that way back before David Stern, we hardly had any NBA teams that had contact with international markets at all. None. Four, maybe. Um, I'm sorry I get excited, but I lived through this. My, my, my life and my professional career is aligned directly with the rise of the NBA. I graduated from college in 1985. Uh, I watched Michael Jordan hit that shot um, in 84 against Georgetown and then come into the league. So I've seen all of this happen and I'm thankful for it because I knew what it was like before that time. Um, the McDonald's uh, Championship in 1997, uh, this, as I said, was one of the most visible international basketball competitions in the world. Uh, this was featured on the uh, ESPN Last Dance documentary. Um, I had the great fortune of attending this event. Uh, I'm such a loser. I, I got married a couple of years before this, wasn't able to take my wife on a, on a honeymoon because I was too busy. Uh, I understood that the McDonald's Cup was going to be in Paris. I had a client, Steve Rich, University of Miami, who was playing in Argentina for Artinas de Cardovas. Uh, he was going to play one of the four teams. It was Olympiacos, um, Racing PSG, uh, Atenas, and the Bulls. And I remember knocking on the door and going into uh, the study there and saying to my wife, hey, you know that honeymoon we never had? Why don't we go to Paris in October? Uh, but it was really, she understood. And this is some of the sacrifices. My family sacrificed so much, put up with me over the years of doing this type of work. Um, but it was an amazing experience. Um, I actually met with Gary Krause in Paris, hung out with the Bulls and other players, and the city was just electric. It was simply electric. I can't begin to explain to you just how special that was. Um, 
But uh, here's a picture. Steve is on the left there, University of Miami, they call. There he, he's got a bald head, but uh, uh, soon thereafter he adopted the Dennis Rodman uh, colored hair and piercings and everything, and that's what they called him, the, the baby Dennis Rodman. But this is him playing for tennis uh, in Argentina. So as the impact and the footprint of global basketball grows, the NBA and FIBA are engaged in a battle with football for the hearts and minds and market share of the people who reside in a few of the most densely populated places on the earth. Um, I don't know just how much the public is aware of this this battle uh, between football and basketball, and it's fueled by sneaker companies. It's all to gain market share and to get new consumers. Um, but I, I, I'm not really sure if the general public knows about these amazing projects that uh, so much energy and funds are being poured into by both sports. And I just wanted to talk about them just a little bit in case you guys were not aware of them. Uh, first, the NBA in China. China is a key strategic nation for the NBA. It is the NBA's largest business partner outside of the USA. NBA China, a separate business arm of the NBA, was valued by the Sports Business Journal as being at $5 billion. There's a statue of Kobe Bryant, who was, and a lot of people don't know, the most active and visible NBA player in China before his death. Um, he spent many, many hours doing camps and working with kids. And what some people don't know is that he invested millions of dollars in organizations to feed and educate poor Chinese children. Um, Kobe was a great man, and I miss him uh, dearly. Uh, quick little thing, on the day of his death, there were a lot of rumors circling that Rick Fox was on that, that helicopter. And as I told you earlier, Rick Fox is uh, was one of my first clients and a good friend, and I was scared to death at the rumors that were coming back. Um, and I, I cannot look at a picture of Kobe or Gianna. Now I'm still, it's, my heart is heavy about it. Kobe was a force of nature, um, but he was doing a lot of things behind the scenes uh, like this that a lot of people don't know. But there's a statue of him at the Guangzhou Academy of Fine Arts Museum in China. Um, there are NBA offices in Beijing, Shanghai, Taipei, and Hong Kong. And in March of last year, the league opened up the second largest NBA store outside of North America in Beijing. Uh, when I talked about the local mindset and gathering information, um, these offices <laughs> that the NBA has and the contacts that the NBA has, people on the ground, there are reports that there are people that have talked that Silver was constantly on the phone with his staff and his business partners in China getting real-time hot information from ground zero about COVID-19, while the majority of the rest of us had no clue. Um, so I'm just trying to link the two together and, and also uh, to get you to understand that managing a global sports business enterprise is totally different than having a domestic one that focuses on sport that doesn't go beyond the borders. It's got its challenges. Uh, but it also has some significant, unique rewards that come from it if you have the confidence and the, the, the understanding to accept and process. So anyway, to, to move on, a lot of people don't know that the NBA is in Africa. Uh, I'm sure you guys heard about its time in, in China, but uh, the NBA has spent a lot of time developing uh, the continent of Africa for its product. Uh, the NBA and the SEED project, S-E-E-D, which stands for Sports, Education, and Economic Development. It's a nonprofit organization based in Senegal that uses basketball as a platform to engage youth in academic, athletic, and leadership programs. Uh, they partnered with the NBA to launch the NBA Academy Africa. And uh, this NBA Academy Africa is a lead training center uh, in Senegal for the top African male and female prospects 
and it's the first of its kind on the continent. And what's even more significant is that in addition to the advanced basketball training that they get, each member of this academy is enrolled in a local high school and receives academic and financial support from the NBA. So they're changing lives, changing lives. Um, I don't know if you guys knew that the ball or basketball Africa League, uh, which was going to be Africa's premier professional men's basketball league, was scheduled to take place and begin in March of this year, but it was postponed indefinitely. We don't know when they're going to start. The league is a joint effort between the NBA and FIBA, uh, with sponsorship from Nike, the Jordan brand, and Pepsi. Uh, Twelve teams will compete in two conferences. Regular season games will be in seven host cities around Africa, in Tunisia, Senegal, Angola, Nigeria, Egypt, and Morocco. And uh, the first ever finals are scheduled to be held in Rwanda. Um, I know there are a lot of people that don't know about this, and uh, it's a shame that it was postponed due to COVID-19. Africa is a place that the NBA has long been interested in, as well as all of basketball. Uh, but this was the first step to actually get some organization and some uh, resources behind major projects to start at the grassroots level. Uh, and it's a shame that it wasn't able to start, but perhaps we'll be able to get that started uh, by sometime early next year in 2021. Uh, NBA in India. Uh, a lot of people don't know about the time that the NBA has been in India, uh, but tremendous resources and time. Uh, 2019. NBA India games featuring the Kings and the Indiana Pacers was held at the SCI Dome in Mumbai. Uh, this landmark event marked the first competitive games played by teams from any North American sports league on Indian soil, the first ever. And we know that the is one of the world's densest. Again, it's about reaching hearts, minds, and developing market share. Uh, the NBA and FIBA and the BSA, the Basketball Federation of India, initiated a social responsibility program for children, Basketball Without Borders, featuring NBA Hall of Famers, past and present stars. And this uh, initiative focuses on education, health, and wellness for children. Uh, the league also established the NBA Academy Women's Program, which I am a big fan of, uh, uh, women's sports. Uh, program camps at the American School of Mumbai and other venues across the country. And these are hosted and featured uh, by uh, WNBA Hall of Famers and past and present WNBA stars. Uh, the NBA also conducts many junior NBA her time to play clinics for the NBA academies throughout the country. They are really focusing on female youth in India, uh, which is a tremendous social uh, and needed social agenda. Um, and it will be interesting to see uh, what transpires from that. Um, I have a good friend who uh, runs an academy in Ireland. Uh, he was a scout for teams in Australia. And he was sent to India uh, a couple of years back to start looking at talent, and he was really, really impressed by what he saw. Um, he actually uh, played professionally all throughout Europe and has a great uh, project going on for kids and also developing players in, in Northern Europe. But the fact that he was excited about this whole project in India, um, uh, when I heard about that, I was extremely happy. Uh, and what a lot of people don't know is that there are serious, serious plans for an NBA and FIBA supported professional league in India um, before uh, 2025. So, uh, Dr. Rear, I, I, I've uh, talked for a long time. <laughs> you gave me a long leash. Um, is this a pretty good time to maybe? Uh, take some questions and maybe uh, bring down discussion uh, here to, to maybe a different format. Yeah, I think that would be a great idea. Uh, your presentation was 
absolutely amazing. Um, it was, you know, it was way more that we could ask for. It was tremendous in terms of knowledge being imparted. I'm sure that uh, some of our students would have uh, some questions, and we could wind it down that way, uh, Anthony. But uh, thank you so much for what you just gave. I mean, that was just awesome. I have a quick question. Can you hear me okay, Anthony? Yes, yes, we can. Um, I'm a fellow track star myself. I'm a 400 hurdler. I wish time and time again that I was a great uh, short sprinter just to spare me the 400 meter workouts. Let me tell you, um, I'm going into my seventh year of full scholarship track and field. Um, was there ever a time where you felt in college, it's kind of a two part question. Have you ever felt um, when you went into college athletics where you felt that your hobby and your passion for the sport felt more like a job than something you look forward to doing? And how so? Like, if you did, how did you kind of fight that to keep that motivation? Because you know, track workouts, completely different breed of working out. You're, you're on mute still. Your your uh mic is on mute. I'm so sorry. Can you hear me? Uh, now we can. Now? Yes. Okay. I'm so sorry. Uh, this is why old people shouldn't uh, do. <laughs> um, your question is tremendous, and uh, the 1976 Olympics in Montreal changed my life. It was at that point that I really I was telling my daughter. Just last night, she has a journal that she uses, and I created a journal, and I was uh, writing in there what I was eating and what I was doing, and that's all I wanted to do was go to the Olympics, and I was kind of projected to maybe do the 84, 88 Olympics, and when I got to college, uh, I hit a wall. Um, I had done so much training as a young athlete. I had done, uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not bragging here. And you'll understand this. Uh, I talked about winning seven high school championships. Um, the 200 as a sophomore, and then the 100, 200, and 400 my junior and senior year, I was burned out. And I got to college, and it wasn't at first what I thought it would be. Um, my coach, uh, Carl Wallen, uh, and actually Vin Lanana, who you've seen him because he's been the, 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 the uh, U.S. national team coach, um, I used to have long conversations with them about why am I doing this? Um, but then there were moments like what I showed you, the picture there, where it made the, the work worth it. Uh, and you've got to understand, you're, you're in Florida here in the nice weather. I, I was in the mountains of New Hampshire. We were happy when it snowed because that meant it was warmer. Um, but yes, that is a common, common feeling of all athletes at every level. Most of the professional athletes that you watch play um, have the same feelings. And we've recently seen professional athletes that decided that they wanted to retire early. And the public kind of look at, looked at this, oh, what kind of problems could they have? They've got all this money, they're in the limelight. It's not easy. It's not easy. What you really have to do is follow your heart you have to make a decision that, uh, or you have to determine whether is this really for you or not. And and I've had this discussion with my daughter, who's a, a, a was a soccer player, and she's no longer playing in college. Um, whatever decision you make is okay, but you have to love it. You should not be doing anything that you don't love or you're not committed to. That goes for a sport, a job, or anything. Um, as a sprinter, uh, my father used to say, Tony, can you give me something in the middle? Either it's nothing or you're going 100 miles an hour. Yes, either you're committed or you're not. And it's okay if things change. But yes, I had those thoughts a lot, especially when I had to, uh, you guys probably fly on planes, I had to ride on buses. And we had the pole vaulters with their poles in the middle and tripping over the aisles. And I'm like, what, what am I doing? Um, on those times, and I'm happy that I have those memories. But it is natural to have those feelings. You have to soul search, and you'll know what's right for you if you keep asking it. And 
you have to make the decision. Don't run for anyone else. Do it for yourself. That's really what this is all about. Did I answer your question or did I? Yeah, it, it's a lot of discipline. It's very rewarding, but you know, when that alarm goes off, goes off at like six, oh, and you're watching the yeah. sunrise, yes. the first thing you're going through is pain in the morning. It is worth it when you cross the line after running yes. sub 60 seconds in a 400 hurdle, but you know, going through it, you you battle a lot with why am I doing this? It hurts, but and, you, yeah, and your friends can do whatever they want, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's it's something special that uh, us student athletes get to appreciate because you got to manage school, maybe a part time job, family, all these other things that might break other people down. But we just the certain tunnel focus that we just and, and, and appreciate later on. I I mentioned I mentioned the challenges I had in college. All that did was prepare me for now. I am now in my old age, I'm, I'm an aspiring triathlete, but I run distances and I equate life to being a distance runner. But the discipline to be a distance runner was forged during those trying times. So I'm here to tell you that the doubt, the pain, all of that will make you a stronger person later on and it's teaching you lessons. So just accept it, but continue to ask those questions. Um, and you'll know what to do in your heart. Thank you. We have a few more. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. We have a few more. Oh, I'm, I'm here as long as necessary. I enjoy this. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, I got two questions for you, Anthony. But first of all, congratulations on such a successful career and sticking true to your values and beliefs. Thank um, you. I, uh, I played uh, college tennis, and I went on tour shortly after college to give it a crack very difficult so I was very curious on uh, which tennis players you had worked with and the other curious thing I, I wanted to ask you was uh, I lived in Australia majority of my life and uh, I never liked Australian football so I was so shocked to see such a high revenue and I think you said you liked it so I was curious to ask how an audience you know with only 24 million people uh, in Australia uh, generated so much revenue first of all and second of all if you do like the sport why <laughs> Okay. Uh, your first, the first part of your question, Olga Puchkova, who at the time, or Russian, who was, uh, I think, in the top 10 in her age group, which was 16s at the time. Uh, and I was approached by a group uh, that needed, they, they wanted to sponsor her, uh, but they didn't know what to do. Um, so I literally had to put everything together for this entire project which meant she was a minor, which meant we brought her here uh, and, and took her down south. Uh, where was the Lipton? What's the name of the island uh, in Miami where they used to have the tennis tournament, the Lipton? Uh, um, yeah, there was a temporary site. I can't remember it now. Yeah, well, you take a bridge and go over the causeway yeah. from Miami. Um, there was something, no. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but it's an island right off of Miami. Uh, that's where the Lipton tournament. Now they play it in Dolphin Stadium or Joe Robbie sta Stadium. Uh, um, but I had to put together the entire program for this young lady, which meant doing uh, the visa work for her, the immigration work, the immigration for her father who came over here, setting her up in uh, a residence. Uh, on the island and also making sure because of her age that she uh, got the proper uh, education at the same time. We also had to do the training and then we put together a master plan of tournaments for her to go to to amass the points to be able to get into the big the big tournaments. This is the tennis that I did um, and it was the only one that, that I did. Um, it was an amazing time uh, watching her play uh, I remember being at the Lipton tournament. She wasn't participating, but uh, to be in that um, crowd and that sport, it was totally different from the others that I had worked in. Um, and just being able to uh, build uh, from the ground up this whole thing to help this young woman and her family, uh, and then to watch her go and, and, and participate in tournaments. Some were good and some weren't. Uh, but it was just an amazing time, and it was great for me because it was a break from basketball and football and all of that. Uh, and I can tell by your accent, I was going to ask you if you were from Alabama. 
I have spent a lot of time in Australia, a lot of time in Australia. Uh, I'm the guy who brought Kevin Brooks and Darnell Me to the Adelaide 36ers, if you remember them. Uh, two NBA players from uh, the Denver Nuggets. Uh, Kevin was uh, 15th pick in the draft. Uh, Darnell came from Western Kentucky and in the league to the Denver Nuggets. But uh, here we go again, a second chapter for both of them, bringing them down to Australia. Phil Smythe, uh, the famous Olympian and the coach, uh, was a good friend of mine. So there was a period where I was commuting to Australia spending a lot of time in Sydney, spending a lot of time all over. I've been to Cairns, uh, I've been all over. And being there uh, in a new environment, I, I remember, I've, I've been a, literally, I, I talked about the sacrifices that my family made or to put up with me. I used to go on business trips that were literally around the world. I'm not kidding, literally around the world. I'd go east and come in on the west. But when I went to Australia for the first time, uh, I'd been to Europe when I was younger and all that. It, I was a little, I remember arriving in Sydney at, late at night and I was like, wow, this is way back when cell phones were, had just started. And I'm like, wow, I've never been here before. And it's uh, uh, a place that I'm not really comfortable with. But when the sun came up the next day, Sydney was beautiful. Uh, went all over the country and spent a lot of time in Adelaide. And it was there that I started watching Australian Rules, uh, also cricket, uh, and I just fell in love with it. Uh, the guys in white coats uh, <laughs> after that. As, as far as the revenue is concerned, it's really uh, digital rights. Um, now you can access uh, these games through ESPN Plus and other platforms. And they figured out a long time ago uh, that there was a market for that. Here in North America, it really, didn't catch on. It does. I watch some of it uh, now uh, when I can. Definitely a lot of cricket, um, but it's really the digital rights they figured out they they could go beyond the borders also, and the returns were a lot of money. And it's also very popular. There's a lot of their income uh, for operations rely on game day events and operations from that. So uh, I, I actually tried to convince my wife of. Uh, uh, getting a place. I love Adelaide. Um, Adelaide was very kind to me. You know what? I, I don't have it here. Um, I have a can of uh, Cooper's Draft. Is that right? Uh, Darnell is on a can of Cooper's Draft. I could run in the other room, but I'm not going to. Um, after we won the championship, I was able to get him on a beer can. And for you Australians who know how important beer is to you, uh, that's one of the highlights of my life, too. But I love Australia. It's a wonderful country. Um, I used to talk to the NBL. I'm happy to see what's going on there. They're now one of the, the ball brothers are there. Uh, but I used to tell them, I was like, hey, I remember being in Melbourne. What is the river that goes through Melbourne where the restaurants are right on the river before the stadium on the other side? I, I can't think. I'm not sure. I remember being in a restaurant and then walking to the game and hearing the buzz of everyone talking about basketball and then getting there and seeing a, pro a product on the court that was very much like the NBA with dancers. And I told the guys, you have a great product and this should be bigger than it is. It seems like now they're doing that. Uh, just recently before the, uh, the, before the disruption from the virus, they had these huge outdoor games where there were like 50,000 people coming. So, um, yeah, I'm sorry. I'll go as as you notice here. I, I love to talk, but um, yeah, the only tennis was Olga Puchkova, um, and that was really more an operational issue with that. Um, and as far as Australia is concerned, I could move there tomorrow. I think it's a wonderful co country and uh, wonderful people. Thank you for answering my questions, Anthony. I appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate you. Great, thank you. Next, Mr. Hiller, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hey, Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Um, so my question is, uh, going back to when you were an agent, um, what is the biggest change you've seen in athletes when you first started representing them to athletes nowadays? Um, I've seen a, a huge change. Uh, it's really in the self-awareness of the, the athlete. 
and understanding uh, more. And again, <laughs> uh, I was part of this Jordan movement. That was such an emotional thing of watching that because I was there for many of those things that happened. Um, Self-awareness and an understanding of the power that the athlete has. People do not speak on social issues because he's just a private guy. And he chose to take the middle course um, because no one had reached the level that he reached as far as a brand is concerned. And my personal feeling is that he felt, hey, this is so good and so special. And there's this whole thing of, you, what did it say, you can't see the forest for the trees or whatever it is. I don't think he, un, he knew it was big, but because he was in the middle of it, he didn't realize how big it was, but he knew it was big enough not to mess it up. So he stayed silent. I've seen, I've seen a shift or an understanding in athletes, professional athletes, and even amateurs, but more professional, um, that they do possess power and the ability to speak and influence things. Um, I think LeBron James is, is wonderful for speaking up on issues that he believes in. And you've got to understand, when I talk about Michael Jordan and LeBron James, Michael never did anything like that. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar did. Um, you had a handful of athletes that, that spoke up, but there is a feeling now that uh, words can make a difference. And part of that, part of that, my feeling is, is the the advent of these things, right? Social media, uh, the ability to reach millions uh, directly, Twitter, IG, all of that. And I think that the younger generation has figured out what a powerful tool that was. I'm sorry, I'm a Michael Jordan. Um, he had none of this, and he still was the king of the world. But if he had it, he wouldn't have used it. He's just that type of guy. Um, I also, what I like is uh, players, because I'm a pro player, figuring out that they have power uh, and making decisions about where they will go and play. And I know a lot of people don't like it when they hear, oh, this player is talking to that player and they're going to play together when they get to Brooklyn and all that. I love that. Um, LeBron James has on this, on, on the issue of free agency, LeBron James has kind of turned the pyramid upside down uh, by following the rules, but doing it his way. Now, is it the right way? I don't know. Um, he doesn't have six championships yet. He might achieve that. But what he's done, he's gotten players to stand up and say, hey, and you, you're talking to a kid here. Uh, my dad was an honorary doctor for the St. Louis Cardinals. I had Uncle Lou Brock and um, Uncle Bob Gibson. I didn't know who they were. Um, uh, but Kurt Flood, um, I knew him, and he is the guy that changed free agency for everybody, but he sacrificed his career. He spoke up, and he lost everything. I think now players understand that they won't lose everything, and because it's their life, and this is what I meant about self-awareness, they have a, a stake. Maybe they don't want to go play on the West Coast. They want to stay on the East Coast. So I kind of like the fact that they kind of massage the, the rules. They don't break them but massage the rules and take back some of the power. All right. Thank you for answering my question. Thank you, sir. Pleasure meeting you. I have a question. Yes, sir. All right. Anthony, I have a, I have a statement first. So yes, sir. What, what I was listening to, what you were talking about as an agent. Funny thing is I'm, I'm planning to start my own agency as well. And the same thing that you said is about exit strategy. That was me and my partners. Um, one of our main focus is to talk about exit strategy. So imagine meeting a player for the first time and the first thing you're saying to them is, I know you're going to start your career, but the first thing you want to talk about is how you're going to exit. Because mm -hmm. we got to think about most athletes, uh, they, um, after they retire after three years, they go broke. Yes. 
not not physical right they have no money but they have to sell their house right and find work or do talk shows and stuff like that so to me the number is too high it's like over 90 percent so that, so that's what i looked at so it's funny you said that because that was my whole thing going into this and then the my i have two questions for you that uh what would be your advice for me as an upcoming agent okay and how do you get your first client I think that's a great question for a lot of people here, uh, Anthony. Well, you came up on yeah. the series. Um, because of the agency stuff. Yeah, absolutely. The first statement about post-career planning, you said imagine having that conversation. I don't have to imagine I had that conversation. Um, I actually remember a conversation. I, I'll, I'll withhold the name. Uh, the player didn't play in the NFL that long, uh, but it was right before the draft. In the spring, we were sitting at a conference table, and I said that question to him. I said, this is great. We're about to go into the draft, but you really need to begin to think about what you want to do after this is over. I had several clients prior to that time. Uh, one guy whose dad was in the construction business, and he wanted to start a construction business. So we did little things as he moved through his career. But this one particular football player, uh, what I will say is he was a running back from the University of Miami, and he was a tough guy. He stood up. Uh, by the way, I'm sitting down, but on a, on a good day, uh, I'm happy if I'm 5'5", five, 5'6", five, five, six, six, five, so I'm short. I'm, I'm wide, but I'm short. He leaned in my face, and he basically uh, cursed me out, and he pulled up the paper, and he started – Point, he started pointing at the, the picks that were projected ahead of him, and he said, these guys are just worthless, and uh, I won't need to worry about that because I have so much money. Uh, you and your stupid question, um, you know, why are you bothering me? One of my partners stood up, took him out, got him a drink of water. This guy didn't last a season in the NFL, not one season. Okay. Uh, others that I've had that conversation with, and you don't push it, but you raise it, maybe not before a draft. I probably was a little inartful at that point. Um, but it is a conversation that you have early on because it takes a long time to figure it out. And careers uh, can change on a dime. Um, I am very proud of having a post-career counseling department. Um, in every firm, the firms that we didn't have it, I created it um, throughout my entire career. Uh, the other question about how to start, is, is that, what was the exact part of that? Your advice for, for me as an upcoming sport agent, what, what would be the, uh, an advice? And the other question was, how do you get your first client? Uh, my, my first client... In turn, Anthony? Um, actually, yes. <laughs> Good. He's a new, no, he's, no, he's here. I keep confusing him with James. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my first two clients were Rick Fox and Eddie Pigney. Um, I happened to be interning at a radio show in Boston. Uh, met the guy who, uh, was, the guy who was running it uh, was the sports guy at the radio station. And he interviewed them. I stayed in touch with them. And I talked to them and I said, hey, I could maybe help you to make money on the side doing autographs in malls, all right? And they looked at me funny, and I said, no, let, let's do one, and we'll see what happens. And um, there was a game called NBA Opoly that the uh, radio show host had, so we were selling those and having them autographs, and everybody made tons of money. And after that, Rick and Eddie started getting me in touch with a whole bunch of other people. And at the same time, I had a little bit of credibility because I was working in, uh, with Professor Barry and following him around. Um, I had a really, really for, big fork in the road. Um, I did, uh, I started working in the industry before I graduated from school. I added an extra year uh, at the business school and I was, I guess, interning uh, with a preferred management group out of New York. Um, that's how I met Robert Pack. Um, I was brought in uh, to go and recruit Robert. Um, that's how I met George Raveling. 
very scared of the man at the beginning. He's a big teddy bear now. Um, but you have to be, you have to have initiative. Um, you can't just send a resume out and expect to get um, some type of response from that. Um, the fork in the road for me was I got an offer from the preferred management group to go to work and work as a sports lawyer or an agent. Um, and also at a conference met Dr. Harvey Schiller, who then uh, was the executive director of the USOC. And uh, I, I told you earlier about my book that I keep notes about Olympics. And I remember going out to Colorado Springs and for an interview, and I, I was like, hey, I always wanted to be in the Olympic complex. I'm finally here. But I had a real problem at that time with being a sports executive and working directly with athletes. And I went back and forth and back and forth. And I look at now, and I mean, well, uh, Harvey Schiller went on to run uh, uh, TNT, I believe, or, or the sports, right? Um, and I think he did some big, some big, right, Braves and some big company up in Canada that was buying up a whole bunch of agents. Um, but I wanted to work with athletes. You have to have an iron will. You have to knock on every door. You have to network beyond all networking uh, abilities. And you guys have tools that we didn't have. You've got LinkedIn and Facebook and all these. LinkedIn is an amazing tool. And I get I get requests all the time from young people like you. I'm the type of guy where I'm going to help out. Um, I just got a note two days ago from a guy who's going to start at Fordham Law, uh, I guess this fall. And he was asking me how to, the same question you. You have to have a thick skin. You have to have an abundance of energy, the thick skin to take the rejection, the abundance of energy to keep knocking on doors and to keep getting your name out there and to keep making calls. And I would tell you to go to events as often as you can to meet other people, not the paid events. Um, well, they're trying to get your money, but just be visible and meet because when someone can associate a face with a name or a person and shake a hand. And I know we're in the middle of the pandemic right now, but things will change. Um, you've got to get out there and and really, really be uh, unrelenting uh, in order to break into this business. But it's possible. Um, organizations like the Sports Lawyers Association. Absolutely. And that's what I'm talking about. They all, yes, sir, that's a great, there are many of them, and they have student uh, yes, memberships or, or areas and just going to these conferences. And there are a lot of guys like me who will take your resume and will speak with you. And I'm, I'm here to tell you with, with Dr. Reardon's uh, 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 permission, I'm here to help you uh, beyond tonight. Um, I can't move mountains all the time, but I can definitely open doors. Um, so I'm, I'm more than willing to do whatever beyond this. And uh, Jim, please share the information or however you want to handle it. Absolutely. Uh, but I'm more than willing to help everyone here and, and others who aren't just in the process. Thank you so much. We'd be honored to have you to do that. And thank you for offering that. Ed. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, Craig, did I answer your question? Um, Definitely answered it. And I've, I've been networking, so I I'm, I'm think I'm on the right path so far. So thank you. Uh, one, one thing I will say to you, um, don't be... Uh, don't believe there's only one lane which is representing athletes. There are so many different areas that you can get involved in sports. Um, this is a really, really saturated area, and it's filled with, uh, my mother always told me to use uh, um, nice words, it's filled with a bunch of characters, right? Um, I have encountered characters, I've worked with characters, and I moved quickly away from characters because they're not what I am. Um, so if you choose to go into this business, you, you have to understand that it's highly competitive. Get, tell you a quick, quick story if, if it's okay. I'm the guy, I'm the guy that brought Antonio Gates to the NFL. He was at Kent State, 
I represented a point guard, I can't remember his name right now, took him over to Sweden to play. Jim Christian, who's at BC, called me and said, hey, I've got this big guy, power forward, uh, can you help him out? And I said, coach, I'll take a look and see. Looked at his numbers, I was like, coach, hey, uh, yeah, I can get him a job overseas, but it's gonna be mid, lower level. He said, oh, no problem, that'd be great. By the way, the NFL is calling about Tony. And I was like, what? The NFL? He goes, yeah, 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 he used to play in high school. and he. I was like, what are you talking about? And I did some research, and Antonio Gates was a blue chip quarterback in Detroit. So I said, okay, I'm going to pursue this too, if it's okay with you. Signed him up as a client and got him tryouts and signed him with the San Diego Chargers. I remember distinctly being in San Diego. The only clothes he had were two, two white T-shirts, a pair of jeans, and sneakers, and for four days, I got him in his apartment. Um, he, signed, he opened a bank account. I did everything for him. The season started, and then he became Antonio Gates. For the end of the season, beginning of the next season, Jim Christian called me back and said, uh, Tony's going to call you. And I said, why is Tony calling me? Why, uh, why, why are you calling me and telling me this? Why doesn't Antonio call me? So he's got something to tell you. And I, I said, Coach, this I, I got to let Tony tell you. Antonio Gates called and said, hey, you know, I've got a daughter. I've got bills to pay. I'm signing with somebody else, and I'm firing you. And I'm like, what? Are you serious? Nobody knew who you were, right? And uh, I'm going to say it because he knows I talk about it. But he was approached by a group that offered him money, right? And he chose to go with them because they were offering something I wasn't willing to do. I tell you that story because it's that you have to deal with. These are the characters that I referenced at the beginning. These are the characters that come and go quickly. I've been doing this for a long time. And I've been doing it. I probably have missed out on some business opportunities, but I can sleep at night and I can look at my wife and daughters and know that I did the right thing. So if you're going to go in this area, you have to understand that it's very difficult. But please open your mind to other areas because there are some great things that could be done in different areas, too. Don't shut it off. If this is your dream, follow it. And by the way, um, I left the company and started my own company when my wife was pregnant with my first child. And I asked for her blessing, and she said, what took you so long? Running my own business was the scariest time and the most rewarding time. So good luck to you on that. I'm here to help you in any way that I can to achieve that because I know what it's like. When I was in law school, a uh, friend of mine uh, who was in music, we, we had little business cards and that's what I used to give to Eddie Pickney and Rick Fox because I wanted to start something. So I've been exactly where you are. I know what you dream about. I know what you feel in your heart. And if there's anything I can do to help you, I'm more than willing to do it. Anthony, we had the exact same the exact same story happen with our current sport law teacher, Patrick Lawler. He was, uh, yep, uh, Patrick Peterson, cornerback for the Arizona Cardinals. Okay, Pat Lawler was his first agent. Okay, uh, representation. Same thing. Did everything. Blah blah blah. One day gets the phone call. You're done. That's it. And there's nothing. Big can... company. There's nothing. Exact you same story. Yeah. yeah, you guys will hear that story next next year. Yep. <laughs> so it's not for the faint of heart. The business isn't. Um, we seem to get a lot of um, a lot of job opportunities uh, in sales. The the Dolphins, the Marlins, uh, the Panthers. Um, you know, business to business sales, uh, premium sales, tickets. You know, just general ticket sales, season tickets. What's your thought on that? Everyone says, you, you know, to make it, you got to get into sales. You got to be involved in sales. Um, from your experience, maybe with the NBA, maybe over in, in Europe, just, just general experience. Any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, this is, this is one of the growing areas because the, the, the global business of sports is growing by leaps and bounds. And um, it is a definite way to get in and learn how a business operates because sales is the lifeblood of an organization. Um, I read an article once, uh, and I'm, I'm going to probably not get this totally right, but it basically said that 
the majority of millionaires or billionaires around the world, uh, definitely in this country, um, they all have one thing in common, and that is at one time in their professional career, they were involved in sales. Um, it is a skill that you can use uh, in every aspect of business when you negotiate, um, when you're trying to uh, find a lease for your new office. Um, uh, there are skills that come uh, in handy in learning uh, from uh, working in the sales environment, but you've also got to understand that for these organizations, whether it's the Cincinnati Reds or the Miami Dolphins or the Pittsburgh Pirates, um, this is a very important part of their operations. And not only do you learn about sale, sales, but you are in the heart of the organization and you can see how everything fits together, the mosaic of an organization. You understand how everything is related because most people that just see the team play have no idea what goes on behind the scenes. Um, I've spent a lot of time uh, with different owners at the Dolphins. I spent um, a lot of, uh, had a lot of meetings with all different departments of the Dolphins and I was always struck by the professionalism and uh, the understanding and their grasp of certain topics. Um, I, would, I would really advocate, uh, I, I, think, I, think, I think younger people that want to get in the business see one or two things, like I was saying earlier uh, to Craig, but there's a wide range of, of different ways to get into the business. And just because you get into the business doing one thing doesn't prevent you from going in a different direction. Correct. And after, Correct. Once, once you get in the door, then you can go anywhere you want to. Um, because it's a business, it's a business that's built on relationships. If someone's knocking on the door and said, hey, I, I worked at uh, American Express or, you know, uh, some other business. But if they say, I use, if, if, if you're knocking on the door at, the New York Yankees. Uh, I used to work at American Express. They're like, okay, okay. But if you say, hey, I worked for the uh, Dallas Cowboys, they're going to listen. They're going to listen. And they may know someone. This business is all driven on someone that you worked with or a coach, uh, you know, that you coached you or a player. So any way that you can get in and establish, especially when you're younger, and establish yourself and start to build your resume, it's worth it, and it doesn't mean that you have to stay in that position for the rest of your career. And if you sit and you're a sponge and you soak in everything, you can either move through the organization. Uh, remember, Jerry Cross was involved with the White Sox, I think, before he came in. And I don't think he was always in scouting. I have a funny feeling that he was in operations or sales before he got down on the field with players. The bottom line is you can either move up in the organization or can, you can use it as a stepping stone. But once you get in the sports industry and you have a solid resume, um, you can stay in the sports industry. And you're an insider and an outsider. Jerry Colangelo was uh, marketing with the Bulls. Yeah. Okay, that, that was his, yeah, he was marketing and ticket sales. Pat Williams, the same thing. Promotions, marketing, became oh, Pat, a great Pat, GM for the 76ers, what a, yeah. What a great guy. Pat, such a great guy. Awesome guy, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and like you said, it's... All you need is a launching pad. All you need is a springboard. And after that, it's a question of how bad do you want it, what your passion is, and how, how far are you willing to go? How far are you willing to go? One or two more, maybe? Absolutely, as many as possible. I'm, I'm here. Hi, Mr. Hellier. This is Brian. Can you hear me? Yes, Brian, I can hear you. Nice to meet you. Hey. Okay, great. Nice to meet you, too. Thank you very much for uh, joining us tonight. I just had a very quick question I saw on... Um, on your bio or your resume, it says you have uh, superior knowledge of NBA, NFL, and CFL collective bargaining agreements. I was just interested if you could elaborate a little bit on the NFL CBA and how you became involved in that. Was that from legal work or was that dealing as an agent with players and how that knowledge has really benefited you in your career? Yes, sir. Very good question. The collective bargaining agreement or the roadmap or the Bible, if you will, for whatever sport or league that you're in. Um, these are long documents that act actually describe every aspect 
of the business um, from uh, how money is paid and divided, uh, how, how money is paid to players. Uh, you'll find in the NBA collective bargaining agreement issues about equipment and uniforms. It has everything in it. In order to effectively represent your client, whatever it is, Major League Baseball, NFL, um, NBA, you have to understand the entire document because, when, especially on the financial side and the contract side, because you have to know how the salary cap relates to your client's uh, employment situation. You have to understand what can be done and what cannot be done. Be done. You have to understand the rights that the team has. Uh, look at Dak Prescott right now, uh, who's in a contract uh, situation uh, with the Cowboys. Um, before the Cowboys took their action, before Dak and his representatives went in to talk to the Cowboys, they set a roadmap of all the possibilities of what could happen. And these days, things have changed so much. Like the NBA, in the old days, it did not address rookie contracts and the values associated in each year depended upon where you were drafted. It was kind of wide open. You need, you have to know these documents inside and out in order to represent your client effectively. Otherwise, you'll be taken advantage of. Um, so being the head I was and being on, my, my hair was on fire uh, when I was younger. When I was in law school, I was reading these documents and I would sit up with Professor Barry and say, what does this mean when it, you know, um, I, I just was immersed in it. But it, when I came out, I can tell you that my legal background um, helped me, under, especially after going through constitutional law, <laughs> constitutional law course, uh, studying the Constitution, the CBA is nothing. But it is imperative, imperative to know every aspect of these documents so that you can adequately represent your client. And you just take the time. You take the time to read it. You take the time. You're constantly uh, gathering information about where the cap is and what the – that's the big issue right now. The reason why a lot of these teams want to get back online – I'm sorry. The reason why a lot of the teams want to get back online and play is not just because of the loss of the money from the gate revenue or all of that, but it's because of the effects on the salary cap going out in the future. Um, I don't have all the details, but I think there are maybe six or eight teams in the NBA right now, if the salary cap were to drop, that they would only have a small amount in order to get players, and the rest of them will be in big trouble if the salary cap drops. How do you know these things? By reading the collective bargaining agreement, and it, be, it becomes your best friend. But is this the only way to adequately represent your client? You have to know it back. And you just read and study and read and study. Uh, you make mistakes, you learn from mistakes, but you get stronger uh, too as you move along. So, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. One more. We're starting to lose a little bit of bandwidth here. Um, uh, so, I don't know what's going on. We have maybe one more question, two more? Sure, as many as you want, sir. Hi, Anthony, it's James. I have a question. Um, uh, the NFL, not the NFL in particular, but, but a bunch of like prominent players like Saquon, Zeke just put out a video like a few seconds ago con like stating that they want the NFL to condemn racism and like admit that Black Lives Matter. Where do you see this going forward with not just the NFL, but just all the other major sports on like a not just a player level, but on an executive level in terms of like actually increasing diversity as a result of what's going on? The presentation I mentioned to you that the NBA was the vanguard or always at the cutting edge of all of these issues, whether it be legal, financial, or social issues, inclusion, diversity, they recognized early on that um, 
the league had to reflect society. Um, I remember when the first female referees came in, and it's not a big deal now, but I remember sitting with players and they were actually saying, man, I don't know what to do because I talk back to the male referees and what do I do now? Now it's just a foregone conclusion that you're going to have female referees on the field or a court. But the NBA did it in such a subtle way and so quickly, and they trained their female um, uh, referees to the point where no one even thought there was a difference, right? Now you find that everywhere. But I mention that because the NBA is very artful on issues like this because they've dealt with them and addressed them over time. Um, so it's no big deal. There are other leagues who uh, talk a good game about being concerned and uh, interested in issues, but their actions show something differently. Um, I never, uh, I'm going to speak freely, <laughs> Professor uh, Reardon, I'm going to speak freely. I never really understood the whole Jay-Z, NFL, Roger Goodell um, relationship because I really didn't understand it was going to benefit the social issue that was supposedly at the core. I did understand the entertainment part of it and how it could benefit the NFL and Jay-Z from Super Bowl shows and other things. But I think it's not a coincidence that we're sitting up here, unless you can tell me, I don't know of anything else that that relationship produced other than entertainment stuff, right? So um, I looked at a couple of uh, comments this morning about Drew Brees, and I know you guys were talking about that. I think Roger Goodell is going, going to have to do I didn't see the video you're talking about because I was here with you. And to it just happened like it just happened like a few minutes ago, and it's like blowing okay. up now. Yeah. Um, I rem I remember an article earlier today um, that was really great about the whole situation. But um, I think there are certain leagues that are going to find themselves almost painted in a corner, and they can get out, but it's going to take some fancy footwork, and more importantly. Uh, from the media uh, away from the media side, there's going to have to be some concrete and actions made to convince people that they're for real. And I think there are a couple of leagues that are going to struggle with that, and the NFL is one of them. Um, I was born in 1963. Um, my father. All he talked about was Bill Russell and Jim Brown. And it was only later that I understood that it wasn't so much their athletic prowess, but the fact that they also uh, spoke up on social issues. Yeah. Um, I think it's incumbent on players to speak their minds so long as they do it in the right way. And I think the league the NFL is going to have to really partner with players in order to get through this. And if they don't and they try to work with Jay-Z or somebody they think is going to distract, it's not going to work. Um, so I'm trying to choose my words carefully, but some of these thing to do right now. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. It is. No doubt. For you and me both. Yeah. Um, Jim, I was, was it Saturday when SpaceX went up? Uh, was that Saturday? Yeah. I had this great feeling because I was just all into the Apollo moon stuff, and I had models and everything else. And I also remember, I was telling my daughter the other day, I remember the day that Martin Luther King was assassinated. Uh, I was five at the time. I, I remember walking in the dining room. Uh, I'm the youngest of three boys. My brothers, my mother, my father, aunt, they were all around the big dining room table and they were crying. And I'm like, what, what's going on? And they said, oh, Dr. King was just assassinated. And I'm like, oh. And I knew it was serious, but I didn't know what was going on. But this Saturday, I, I, I was brought back 
to this moment where there was strife in the streets and we had rockets going up at the same time. And it's like this weird feeling. Um, it is a difficult time, but it's a necessary time. And the athlete in me, uh, I welcome challenges. Um, and I think there is a way to find opportunity in all of this strife. But if we're going to find opportunity to get better, we're going to have to be honest. And to me, that's where the problem, that's where it's going to get sticky because it's such an emotional issue. I'm not sure if some are willing to unburden. And I'm not sure if there are those that are willing to accept what is given. Uh, I run a 5K almost every night. What happened in South Carolina really got me. Um, I can talk about situations that I've experienced. I don't know if I'm ready to unburden all that. And at the same time, I don't know if people are ready to really receive the raw part of that. But in between both of those, there's, a, there's common ground. And I think that's where opportunity lies. And if we're all honest and we all compromise and we get to that space, we can move out of this better as a country. As a as a as a, 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 a world as world citizens actually, so uh, James, I don't know, uh, Lipscomb, Lipscomb, I don't know if I answered your question or not, but uh, we've got a lot of work ahead of us, and some leagues will breeze through this, and other leagues are going to struggle, and the only way that they're going to be able to come out of this in a good position is to really do some work because they haven't really been interested in doing work before. They could just put a Band-Aid on it. Forgive my reference. Now they're going to have to do real surgery, and it, it's going to be serious. But it's a decision. Where do you want to be? You want to be on the right side of history, or you want to continue to just count money? Uh, answer it because that was an honest answer. That's what, yeah, that's how I wanted. Okay. Okay. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm from the Midwest, uh, the show me state. So uh, my father used to have a term, brutally honest. Bottom line, we can find a way out of this. And we're, we're resilient as a country. Uh, and as a nation. we've dealt with this before. Um, and it's time to make things better for everyone. And I think we could, we could do that. But it's going to take a lot of work. And it won't be overnight. It won't be overnight. No. On that note, I'm going to thank you very much for being with us this evening, Anthony. It was an awesome job, and we'd like to just give you a round of applause. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Yeah. It's certainly my pleasure, sir, and I, I, I'm, I'm so appreciative of the opportunity to speak to your and with you. And I meant what I said. Um, you tell me the right way, but I'm willing to help anyone that needs help, and I'm willing to contribute in any way that, that I can. You don't have to tell me twice on that, because we're always looking for advisors and people to help out and internship mentors and everything else. I know we have people looking to get involved in the, in the law. Yeah. So, all right. Um, all right. Thank you so much. I'm just going to keep these guys for another five minutes here, and then uh, we're going to end. Thank you. Thank you again. Take care. Thank Thanks. Guys. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So. What do you say, 10-minute break and come back for another two hours? No, I don't think so. Um, he was awesome, right? Um, tremendous. Um, probably the most complete um, presentation uh, I've had, you know, at uh, a guest lecture. I mean, we know everything about in, the NBA in India and China now and everything else. The guy was just amazing. Um, and he, uh, I've met him a couple of times in person, um, and he really wants to help. He wants to get involved. I think he eventually wants to teach here, and uh, that, that wouldn't be a bad idea either. So, okay, so remember that rule I told you about. I'm the judge jury here, and I'm going to invoke that rule. We're not going to worry about the other part of the uh, lecture that we were talking about tonight. I will probably put that on video um, the, just to get through the basic process of management, just so you have a, 
a foundation for that going through. Uh, we'll also talk more about uh, sportainment and marketing myopia. What I wanted to do, and if you could do this on the written discussion, what are the similarities that you see? Look carefully between the sportainment article and marketing myopia. There are some similarities there. They're almost the same. Knowing what we are, knowing what industry you're in. Uh, the discussions have been good. We'll get that up next week. Management is not a profession. Next week, we have an awesome guy again, Jonathan Mariner, Marlins, Pan uh, Panthers, CFO of Major League Baseball. If a lot of you remember when Fox was selling off their regional sports networks last year, he was the head of that. He was the interim head of Fox Sports. This is like his fifth year speaking with us. He's tremendous. So we'll be back here. Keep up the good work on the discussions, the assignments. And uh, again, we'll, we're just going to end it here. Uh, thanks. Thank you so much. Some great questions, and we'll see you next week. Stay safe, everyone. I have a quick question. You guys can all leave. I didn't want to hold you guys all up. I didn't want to be that person. What was the, the – you said similarities between marketing myopia and what? And um, what did I say? Uh, sportainment. Okay. Sports has a leisure experience. Already. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We'll see you all again. Professor Reardon? Yes. Um, where would you like us to post that? In one, two, like general discussion? Or? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just, uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Have a good one. See you guys. I got to stop this here.